Welcome everybody. We are live, but we are also on tape from beautiful downtown Kamloops. We're in Studio 2 at Lee's Music. That's Chris Folds. I'm Marty Hastings, and this is our brand new show, Kamloops Last Week. Chris, what are we doing here? Uh, we are here as a augmentation, I think, of our, of our media uh, landscape. We're a newspaper at our core. We're also a website. We have our social media. We have a KTW Digital, and it was Marty's great idea here to uh, branch out into a podcast, video cast, whatever you call this, to uh, look at maybe the story behind the story, go into detail more about stories, and have, uh, and have some guests, interesting guests here. It's going to be news. We're going to have some opinions, sports, business, entertainment. We're going to cover it all, and the name itself, we should probably start with Kamloops last week. We know out there that for many years you have had a go at us. You know, we don't come out every day, so we're old news. We're Kamloops last week, so we wanted to have some fun with that. And it kind of makes sense because we're hoping to come out on Fridays and talk about what happened this past week. This past week. Yeah. Exactly, so it makes sense. We also know that there's a population of you that uh, you take our newspaper off of your doorstep and put it directly into the recycling bin. Well, we're trying to reach you through this new medium. We have a few segments that we're going to get to, but first, none of this is possible without our advertisers, and here is a look at one of them. Hi, Chris. You're doing a really great job. I'm, this, I'm Marty. Oh, all right, Marty. You're doing a really great job. This show is going to be golden. You, and Chris, you're going to be doing Marty, Chris. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't really matter. You guys are going to rock it. I'm so excited about Hey, this is Mike from Lee's Music. Whatever you need for your touring needs, for streaming needs, when the pandemic's over and you want to grow your hair out long and do that thing that you've always wanted to do, give me a call. I'll fix you up with musical instruments, with whatever it is. I'm here, www.leesmusic.net. We haven't even started recording yet, and this guy's trying to get free advertising. Yeah, we're not running that. There's going to be a ton of freedom for you to advertise on this show. Maybe you want to do a commercial. Of course, Chris and I don't have to be in your commercials. Maybe you want to just throw a logo up on the screen. Maybe you want to do host red advertising because this will also be in podcast form. You can contact Chris at ktwdigital.com. And now it's time for the very first segment, the debut edition of Above the Folds. Still enjoying these graphics and had a bit of a chuckle there. Chris, this is your time to shine where you pick a topic that's been on your mind, uh, either from this past week or something that's coming, coming up in the future. Uh, what do you want to talk about this today? Well, Marty, this topic is from the past and the future, and it's uh, last week, this week, and next week. It's about the um, city council, Kamloops Council's uh, kind of fumbled the ball on a uh, COVID relief program for businesses. And what, was, what should have been very, very simple, they turned into a cumbersome mess and uh, I'll, I'll just briefly describe it for you. Um, back when uh, the, the, the health order uh, came in in March, late March, to, uh, to close indoor dining, indoor worship, and indoor group fitness, the, um, the city, to its credit, stepped up and, and, and spent up to $350,000 in helping businesses, restaurants, and, and pubs uh, expand the patios with, with ramps and with, uh, with uh, paver stones and everything. And it was a very important important move because it allowed uh, restaurants to stay in business by expanding the patios. That's great, but the, the indoor fitness groups, uh, yoga, yoga, yoga studios and, uh, and group fitness, they asked, or one of them came to, count, came to one of the counselors, Arjun Singh, and asked, well, how about you waive the fee to, uh, to uh, the park fee to have a, a park uh, permit to, to do our outdoor yoga classes? And Arjun Singh brought it to council, but council didn't even debate it. They said, no, we can't do that. They, they cited a number of reasons that really weren't legitimate. They didn't make sense. And, um, and then we did a story on that about the day after that decision where they said we, we can't waive the park fees. And uh, we did a story with a yoga, a yoga instructor uh, who owns yoga, Oxygen Yoga, Dyna McLeod. And um, after that story came out and she was explaining why it's important for the yoga classes and the group fitness classes to be afforded the same, the same help, uh, Kathy uh, Sinclair and uh, Sadie Hunter, two city councillors, brought back another motion and to, to, to discuss this again. Uh, and it's a notice of motion, which means it can't be discussed until the next council meeting. Unfortunately, they brought that motion back on the 5th, on the 4th of May, and the next council meeting wasn't gonna be, isn't gonna be until the 18th of May. 
which is just a week before these orders are supposed to expire. So what could have been happening for a month, a month and a half for these for these beleaguered businesses, they might get that permission, you know, on the on the on the 18th. But that's almost when the when the when the restrictions uh, expire anyway. So all this time has been wasted, and it's it's not like it's a complicated matter. It's a matter of saying that twenty dollar a day fee. We're going to waive. The, uh, the monetary part will give you the fee, which covers insurance, which covers reservations, and we're gonna let you have your yoga classes, your group fitness classes in the parks. It would have helped these businesses greatly. Uh, they're really struggling. One, the yoga loft announced they're closing because they can't handle this open and closed uh, health order. So I just think they dropped the ball and I, and I hope that they learn from this. It kind of seems like an insult to injury right now as well, because imagine some of these yoga owners small business owners driving by a Planet Fitness and they see lineups of people out the door and these bigger style, box style gyms are able to operate when they're not. So, I mean, how do you think that's got to make someone like, like Dina feel? Well, and that's, and that's the thing. So, so that, that, the, the fact that the, the, the gyms can remain open and, and the yoga fitness studios can't is out of city council's hand, of course. That's provincial health officer Donnie, Dr. Bonnie Henry's call. And we can debate whether it's, it's, it's the right call or not, but they're the experts. But you would think that doing a, 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 low, a low, uh, low, low fitness uh, yoga class in a, in a space spaced out would be no more dangerous than, say, next to a guy who's breathing hard on a treadmill. But that's for them to, to decide. City council did have the power to help these, these businesses out by doing a simple uh, legislative check. And, and, and they didn't do it. They might do it. I suspect they will do it. But I just, I just think about all that time wasted for these poor businesses. Is it too late? Is there anything that can be done now? No, because the notice of motion means legally they have to wait until the next next meeting to debate this motion, and I think they will uh, look at the motion. I think they're they're going to pass it, and unfortunately, the, the, there was a two week break between the mo- notice of motion and the next next uh, next motion. Arjun Singh, who introduced the first motion, did tell me in between. I, he called me and we talked about it, and he was he's very diplomatic, but he said he should have worded it better. You know, people thought that the yoga studio people would, would be in the middle of Norbrock Stadium at second base while the Wolfpack had a practice around them. That wasn't the intent. The intent was to go to many of the parks. I think Kamloops has the most parks of any city in BC. We have the largest municipal park in the entire province, Kenna Cartwright. There's ample room for someone to go in there with 10 people, as per the rule law, and have a yoga class spaced out. Prince Charles Park, Riverside Park, Pioneer Park. There's parks everywhere in this town. It just seems something so simple was made complicated. Uh, for no good reason. Just last one, it's kind of off topic here, but how do you feel people are doing right now with general COVID fatigue? And do you think that's going to augment some of the anger that some of these small businesses are feeling? Because this has been going on for so long now and they're, uh, they've got to be kind of uh, at their wit's end. I think so. I th- I'm quite impressed how people are still sticking to the rules. I'm quite impressed how people are still are still, uh, you know, weathering it, uh, notwithstanding the, the the crazy conspiracy theorists who come through town every so often. But I think um, I think the more that decisions like this that should be made easy are made difficult, only lends credence to those who say, "Aha, there's something behind this." When there really isn't something behind this, it's just a, it's a virus. Yeah. Lastly, I, I want to give a shout out to some of the staff members that are working at some of these big gyms. I go to Planet fitness and uh, there's some pretty aggro customers right now. I saw a guy getting the boot the other day and he was kind of yelling at staff and they've done a pretty good job of uh, keeping that place clean. So congrats and uh, to everyone that's doing a good job uh, keeping those places clean. Anything else you want to add uh, in your segment here? No, only that I hope council learns from this. Uh, you know, we can be critical, but we can also have constructive criticism. I think that from this, we can learn going forward because there'll be many more issues this, you know, through the pandemic because there'll be post-pandemic issues that we need to deal with too. And this, hopefully, this is a learning, learning process. Well, that was Above the Folds. And now we're going to move on to our second segment, which is called The Tattle of Hastings. This is the Tattle of Hastings, and normally it's probably just going to be me talking about something that's on my mind and sharing some opinion, but today we were lucky enough to get a special guest, Kelly Olinick of the Houston Rockets. He was traded in March from the Miami Heat to the Houston Rockets, and since then has been lighting it up in a contract year. He's having a career year. He's just coming off a $50 million four-year contract, and he's in line to get a bunch more money wherever he goes. He hasn't been home in almost two years, but we got a hold of him in a hotel room, and here's a bit of that interview. You probably haven't been home to see your family in a long, long time. How long has it been, and and how much is that weighing on you that you haven't been able to come home and see see your family? 
Yeah, it's been uh, almost two years. It'll be two years that kind of end of May this summer. Um, it's crazy, you know, with the bubble and then, you know, the short off season and the borders being closed and everything that's going down, it's, you just haven't been able to. And it's, it's been real tough, you know, obviously, you know, thank goodness for, you know, technology today and, you know, phones and texting and calls and FaceTime. Um, but it's definitely just not the same. Yeah, speaking of technology, I know uh, gaming is something that you are into a little bit, and that's a way that you can kind of keep in contact with some of your friends. Can't leave the house, you know, kind of stuck. Um, but, you know, it's been great. Um, you know, it's something that you know, guys do to bond all the time, you know, especially in college. And then, you know, getting out of college, it's a definitely a way to keep, you know, keep in touch. You know, when you're gaming, it's like a, you know, a two, three-hour phone call, you know, with your buddies, you know, <laughs> just, you know, talking smack, you know, bashing on one another, you know, catching up. I know one of those buddies is uh, Kamloops resident Scott Pinio, and uh, I heard that you bought him uh, a new set of golf clubs for his for his birthday. How important is it to you to kind of maintain those those old relationships throughout your NBA career? Yeah, it's big. I mean, those, you know, those are your, your day one, your day one people, A1 since day one. You know, Scott, you know, been there for, you know, along my side basically since elementary school, you know, since I moved out to Kamloops. Um, you know, and it's, you know, those, those people, you know, they're, I read something the other day that's like, there's, uh, you know, there's, you know, friends for seasons, you know, friends for a reason and friends for a life, lifetime, you know, and, you know, he's a, he's a lifetime. You know, I, I got into golf, especially, you know, a lot more this last year, because we were in the bubble for a hundred days. And uh, the only thing we were allowed to do outside of the hotel was golf. You know, they would shut down the golf course with us. So I went with Andre Gudala almost every, you know, every chance we got, we probably golfed like 25 times. You know, he got me into it. So, what are you uh, shooting these days? What's your what are you scoring? Um, you know, actually, like I was pretty good. My like, I sh I shot in the eighties. Um, yeah, like I I shot in the eighties a couple rounds. You know, that was like the best I you know I could ever do. But um, you know, I definitely got way better. I'll tell you that much. So, <laughs> I had to had to get you know Scott a, a pair of clubs so he can't you know have any excuses when come on there and bust his ass. Only a couple more personal life questions, and we'll talk about basketball. I heard you're engaged. I am. Yeah. <laughs> Who is she? Yep. When are you getting married? <laughs> Her name's uh, Jackie McNulty. She's she's from Montana. She went to school in Gonzaga. Um, beautiful girl. Obviously, obviously super nice. Um, she's an accountant. Um, she lives down in Austin now, um, Austin, Texas. Um, lived there for you know, I think seven years now. Um, but yeah, she's, she's, you know, super intelligent, super smart. Um, one of the biggest hearts you'll ever meet. It strikes me that, uh, you might need an accountant in your life. Looking at some <laughs> contracts, uh, I think you're somewhere in the range of $60 million just through your, uh, MBA contracts. What are some of the pitfalls that, that potential pitfalls that come along with, with making so much money and having that much money? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's pitfalls. I mean, you're, you're blessed to have, you know, have money in, in any certain, you know, any, any form or, or way. I mean, I think, you know, obviously with money comes responsibility, comes a lot of, you know, you know, especially with public money, you know, it's, it's different when, you know, you know, who knows, you know, a guy like you could, could walk down the street, be making 60 million and, and no one would be the wiser, right? I'm not um, saying that right now, but <laughs> but 59, 59, you know, what are we, 58. Um, but you know, you know, when you're you're, you know, contracts public and you're a public figure and in all that, um, you know, obviously, you know, people are always coming to you, you know, for asks, you know, for money, different, uh, you know, investment, different kind of things, and um, you know, you gotta be able to navigate, and negotiate all those things. Um, you know, make sure that you know you're investing in yourself first. You know, making sure that you're taking care of yourself and your your loved ones and your family and, and your friends and um, and then, you know, trying to help make an impact in, in any way you can. The trade turned out to be or has turned out to be an amazing thing for you individually. Career highs in a bunch of categories. You're seeing the floor more than ever. Why has it worked out so well for you individually? Um, you know, the trade was, you know, a blessing in disguise for me, you know, to go. You know, I kind of it just opened a lot of doors. Um, you know, obviously in Miami, we had a great team, you know, who was kind of, you know, I had a you know, specific role that I was kind of feeling, you know, and here it was, it was, you know, it's a lot more open. There's a lot of freedom, you know, to, you know, to play how, you know, I've always played basketball, um, you know, and obviously it's been, you know, an up and down over here in terms of, you know, players in and out of the lineup, you know, so 
for me, I've had a lot more uh, responsibility on my shoulders over here. Um, you know, kind of to do a little bit of everything, you know, play a lot of different positions, inside, outside, handle the ball, make plays for others, you know, score, rebound. Is there a part of you that kind of looks back at your career and, and, and says, you know, look what I could have done if I was given some more opportunity? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, 100%. It's like, you know, as a player, you always think, like, oh, I could do more. You know, I could do more. You know, I could do this. I could do that. Um, and, you know, a lot of times you don't get the opportunity. So it's, it's fun to get that opportunity and to show that you actually can. You know what I mean? Um, you know, being able to adapt is, is one thing. But, um, you know, also, you know, coming in and be able to prove that I can't. Like, you know, don't forget, I can, I can, do, I can do all this as well, you know? And um, that, that's been special for me and it's been fun. And um, hopefully it's been fun to watch. You're probably going to need your fiance's help here again because you're having a career year in a contract year and you're heading to free agency. Um, what's the most important thing for you about this next contract? Do you just want to cash in? Is it all about the money or is it about going to a contender and, and how you're going to be used? What's most important to you about this next contract? Yeah, I mean, I, I, money definitely plays a role. I mean, you know, <laughs> I think if anybody's given them the choice there for more money or less money, um, you know, no matter what the job is, is you know, if you're given a, the choice for, you know, a job in Vernon or a job in Cam for, you know, twice as much as a job in Kamloops, you know, it's hard to kind of turn that down, right? Um, so money definitely plays a, a role, but I don't think it's the end all be all. Last questions on the Olympics. Massive tournament coming up here in June. Are you intending to play in that and, and trying to help Canada get to the Olympics? I mean, my hope and goal is always to play in the Olympics. Um, you know, ever since I was you know, young, young, watching Steve Nash play, you know, in the Sydney Olympics in 2000 um, in Canada, you know, that's been my goal to you know, get to the Olympics, play in the Olympics. You know, obviously, it's a tough situation right now with the contract year. Yeah. Um, usually, free agency is July 1st. So you would be through free agency onto the Olympics. The Olympics are like end of July, beginning of August, right? So you'd be fine. You know, this year, because it's been pushed back, you know, is free agency is August 1st. So it's, it's a tough, um, you know, tough decision because if you get hurt, you know, that's you know, you're, <laughs> good luck getting signed, basically. Right? Um, you know, you're going to have to wait a year and then do a kind of short deal to prove you're healthy and, um, you know, all that. So, um, you know, still trying to work through it, you know, hopefully – maybe get some, you know, check into insurance and all that kind of stuff and what we can do to protect ourselves. But, um, you know, my goal and hope is that I can play, but, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it shakes out. That last bit of the interview is pretty interesting to me, Kelly talking about whether he's going to play for Canada or not. It's a last chance Olympic qualifying tournament, June 29 to July 4 in Victoria. It's Greece and China in a group with Canada and then Uruguay, the Czech Republic and Turkey in Group B, the winner of that tournament goes to the Olympics. Now, Chris, you saw his answer to that question. What's your feel? Do you think he's going to play for Canada? If I was a betting man, I'd say he's not going to play for Canada because of the insurance issue, because of the change in the free agency date, and because he is in the contract year. So I, I don't think he will. I'm sure would be surprised if he did. I know he wants to. He cited Stevie, Stevie Nash, the greatest Canadian player of all time, back-to-back, two-time MVP champion. But I think... Um, if I was a betting man, I'd say no, only because it's still about he needs to, he, his career is important and his career is based on the money. And like he said in the, in the video, you know, if you get injured, it's, it's like you got a year and you got to prove yourself again. It's like starting from the bottom. It is tens of millions of dollars on the line. I actually disagree with you, though. My first thought was to agree with you and he's going to just play it safe and, and, and it's all about the money. But he has been one of Canada's most reliable players. He almost always wants to wear the maple leaf when he can. And I just think for him, can you imagine 50-year-old Kelly Olenek looking back and realizing that he could have played for Canada, he could have helped them finally get over the hump first time since 2000, going to the Olympics, and he's sitting on his veranda rich and realizing that he's not quite fulfilled because he didn't go to the Olympics. So I disagree. We're going to see what happens with that. And that's... Speaking of rich... Let's do a wager here, okay? The, okay. The, the loser gives 20 bucks to a charity of the other's choice. I say he doesn't play. And wings at the Fox and Hound. You're on. All right. That has been the title of Hastings. And now we're going to move to our final segment, Last Week This Week.
This is the first ever last week, this week segment. In this segment, Chris and I are going to interview some pretty fantastic guests, and we think we have a fantastic one this morning. Her name is Jessica Wallace. She works at Kamloops this week, and she's been covering the Souk Gill TNRD story for us and folds. I was hoping you can give us some more background on, on that story. Yeah, for those who haven't read it in our newspaper, Kamloops This Week, the, uh, Jessica worked on this story for close to a year, uh, trying to get information on uh, spending habits at the TNRD, Thompson Nicola Regional District, based on some, some tips we had. And she worked and worked and worked through freedom of information requests and through uh, dogged phone calls and through talking to numerous sources, up to nine or 10 sources. And what, uh, what the result was uh, a, a big feature we did in the newspaper that showed that the uh, then CAO of the TNRD, Sue Gill, had spent a lot of money, uh, much of it legitimately, but much of it questionable, $8,000 ice, ice wine rooms, uh, many, many visits to uh, high-end restaurants, liquor stores, golf courses. And uh, the, the story was, uh, was published. Um, there was predictably outrage in the, in the populace. And resulting from that, that, uh, that feature was a uh, massive policy changes at the TNRD, changes in who reports to who, and an RCMP criminal investigation into potential financial crimes. So it is quite the story, uh, and it's followed up in the, in the, uh, the May 12th edition of uh, KTW with some additional stories, and uh, that's where we're at. I think if all goes well now, we can bring Jessica in. Jessica, how are you doing? Not too bad. Thanks for having me. Congratulations uh, on this new show. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, how does it feel to be the first ever last week, this week guest? Feels exciting. I'm, ex I'm glad to be here. <laughs> All right, I know you got a meeting to go to, so we'll dispense with the small talk. Chris, why don't you start, lead the way here with some questions for Jessica. Sure, Jessica, this is old hat for you. You've been on CBC National. You've been on many, many uh, regional and local uh, uh, media newscasts. Um, why don't you just talk about, first of all, just how this story came about, uh, just generally from the time we first heard about it until we published it in February. Yeah, so this story, you know, kind of just started from basic questions about why the story around Gil's sudden departure had changed. You know, we heard he was, you know, he was gone. We heard he was on vacation. He retired. He, um, you know, he resigned. We heard all these conflicting things. And it started with asking questions about why the story was changing and kind of going from there and Chris, I know we had conversations about, well, if something, you know, funny kind of did happen here and perhaps maybe he didn't retire as now is kind of still the, the, the line on what happened, um, perhaps, you know, there might've been a settlement and perhaps um, if that was the case, then that would be all public information because it would have happened with public dollars. So you had kind of advised me follow the money, which, was right because um, we did an FOI request seeking the settlement information, which took some time to come through. But in the meantime, um, you know, beat reporting, you're covering the regular meetings. Um, at this time, it's during the pandemic. So I'm sitting at my kitchen table, reading the budget update and seeing this line about $200,000 in salary continuance costs. And it's just, you know, one line item out of this big budget kind of, you know, I think I even said like, I think, I think that's it or, you know, something like that and called you Chris and said, Hey, what do you think this is? And, you know, questions um, to the finance director led to kind of the realization that this was part of that severance that we had been looking for and um, kind of everything kind of followed from there. There's been a lot of other stories that have followed, but that was really what all started. It was those questions about why the story had changed. And on that note, uh, had that number not shown up on that one little number, this story may never have come out, which is interesting. And I think it goes to, you know, you know the, the mundane work of looking through reports, right? Looking through reports and seeing something that jumps out at you. And, and to maybe if I read it, I might not even see, notice that and, and we would have lost the story. When, when you um, were going through the story, when we published the story, the, the, re the reaction from the public and other media w was quite substantial. BC Taxpayers Federation, Global News, CBC. Um, how, um, how was your, uh, the, the information uh, funnel after that from the TNRD, has that improved since we did this story? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, from the beginning when we were just trying to push through to get information, 
Um, and, you know, even being told, you know, kind of to, to, to swallow the line even to some extent. Um, and, you know, why do you keep pushing this and from, from then and having to file, file FOI requests to get basic information such as expenses for the CAO to now um, there's a lot more transparency and there have definitely been significant changes that have been made, I would say. Yeah, we're not here to rehash old news. There is new news. You dropped another piece last night online and today in Kamloops this week. Um, what's new? What's the latest? Yeah, I mean, um, so, you know, this story continues to have legs. Um, the the questions that followed, you know, this, this um, half million dollar severance package to Gil um, for his unexpected departure kind of led to what happened. And um, from there, have been talking to sources um, who have been tipping us off to various um, different angles. Of course, there's, you know, um, challenges with um, anonymous sources. We can't just print verbatim um, anonymous um, information necessarily. There are legal hurdles and standards of proof that um, are required to get things into the paper. So we've continued to follow up on tips that we've received and um, more spending questions as detailed in um, today's camps this week, and um, I would encourage people to read it. Um, questions about contracts, a vendor in particular, and taxpayer money going to um, a religious organization. When you uh, talk to uh, the politicians at the TNRD since then, how has the relationship been amongst those people you dealt with pre and post story? It's mostly change but um i mean i think flat comes with the territory when you're reporting on stories that are high stakes there were times that were pretty stressful <laughs> um but um i've had a lot more off the record conversations and um even some people to tell me you know keep going you're going in the right direction so i just continue to do my job and um try to take some of the the more negative side of the job kind of off the chin and just keep going forward based on the information I receive and that's just part of it all. Okay. Uh, one last question I had was the, um, the, uh, the open data spreadsheet that you created uh, with, with help from some, some people you know. It was quite remarkable in that it took many, many hours to create this and what it is is people can go on to CamelousThisWeek.com, search TNRD spending and, and they can look through this entire spreadsheet, filter it, sort it however they want to see where the money was spent, who was there at the, at the dinners, how much booze was bought, how much coffee was bought. Um, why is this, like that, that's, that, that's sort of like open source journalism for the people. What would you say to people who say, well, why is this story important to us? Why, why should the uh, Joe taxpayer care about this? Well, I think that the importance of the spreadsheet was the fact that people know more than we do, and this is a developing story. So, you know, more information has come in the wake of that. People can see things between the transactions that we might not know about, and then we can continue to follow up. Um, also for transparency's sake, you know, how we reported on this and how we it's, it's, it's almost like showing your work in school, you know, You're, um, this is this is how we came to what we reported on it, it helped to inform our story, but also there was information in there that didn't make it into the story. So maybe there's something people see that they should let us know about and we can continue to work on this and find out more about what happened. But I think the importance of this story is, you know, this is all taxpayer funded. This is all, this is you know, democracy. This is people working um, on behalf of the people. So we deserve, the taxpayers deserve to know what's going on with, by those people who they've elected and they deserve to know how their money is being spent. So, you know, while some things might be within policy has, as has been kind of the, um, the word of the TNRD from day one, um, you know, are those policies good? And that comes down to decision makers and those decision makers are elected by people. So it all comes back to what the taxpayers think. So did they think that's okay? And they have a right to decide. Right. Last one for me, Wallace, you worked on this thing for basically a year. You knew there was going to be some backlash, some repercussions. What was it like for you the night before this thing dropped the first big piece? What was your state of mind at that point? 
Um, it was a bit of a mixed bag, I guess. <laughs> um, there was uh, some relief in the sense that, you know, this is something we had worked on for a long time and it felt in a sense like, you know, we want to get this this out there and it felt a bit of a relief to kind of share it with the world after kind of Chris and I had been behind the scenes working for a long time and um, kind of in the bunker <laughs> during the pandemic. So uh, it was relief. It was, you know, a bit surreal to see it on the page finally when it was laid out and to proof the pages. You know, I was proud. I was proud to work for Canvas this week in a paper that would publish this kind of work and take the risk. And, um, you know, I was proud to work with Chris on this really closely. And it was it was a bit of everything. <laughs> Nerves. <laughs> All right. I think you actually have a TNRD meeting to go to. So we're going to let you go. Thanks for being our very first guest on Last Week This Week. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you continuing to highlight the work that we're doing. And yeah, I wish you the best with this. This is awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. All right, that's been our show for today. Before we go, I want to thank uh, our sponsors. We have one so far. It's Lee's Music. Uh, thanks to Mike and Bonnie behind the scenes right now trying to make us look good. I know that's not easy. And Bonnie for helping with all the graphics that you've done. I want to thank uh, Scott Finley and the Grand Ones for some of the music that you've heard. And that's it for today for Chris and for Marty. Thanks for watching. <laughs>